With record numbers of resignations, retaining your top talent is tough. Many, many employees are on the move right now because they want to transition into a new role or improve skills in particular areas. So what if you could help your people reskill or upskill? In this episode of the People and Performance Podcast, we talk about the tools and the resources needed to ensure successful L&D and workforce planning initiatives and how it could help you retain your best employees. Listen as we chat about what it takes for leaders to develop an environment that successfully elevates employee well-being and professional development. Chris Buelling and I hope that you enjoy this conversation that we had with Dr. Spencer Niles, Professor of Counselor Education and Co-Director of the Thrive Research and Intervention Centre at the William and Mary School of Education in Williamsburg. Dr. Niles is also Senior Vice President, Career Planning and Development at CUDA, a career guidance solution provider. Dr. Niles, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Bill, it's great to it's great to be with you. Thank you. What's the case for learning new skills? How can it open up new possibilities for job seekers? Uh, and and, and yep. you know, as part of that, is, is that is that on one's own back to go out there and learn new skills? Should they instead look for an employer that's um, okay with the fact that they've got uh, certain skills, certain transferable skills, perhaps, and they can train them on the job uh, with others because it's more about their aptitude? Is it a mixture of both? I would agree, Bill, that it it is the latter, and uh, you know it's a it's a both and kind of situation. You know, there there are two basic uh, facts that we have to always remember related to career development. One is the basic fact that the self concept, what we believe to be true about ourselves, how we understand ourselves, evolves over time, making choice and adjustment continuous processes. We're always learning, we're always growing, we're always having encounters with our environments that influence us and the wise people among us pay attention to those experiences and then use them to formulate uh, uh, choices in terms of what next and what the implications of those experiences are for who they're becoming and who they hope to become. So that's always going on. Uh, It's not unique to a pandemic, it's always happening. I think what happened during the pandemic is people had more opportunities to really reflect upon how their self-concept has been evolving in light of the events that they've experienced in the last uh, couple of years. At the same time, not only is the self-concept evolving, making uh, choice and adjustment continuous processes, the world of work is evolving, making choosing and adjusting continuous requirements, both are occurring. So we're evolving, Work is evolving, and the intersection of those two, what I would call facts, have significant implications for how we need to manage our careers. One is, I think we have to take responsibility for how we are evolving. We have to be the ones that pay attention to our experiences and what their implications are for who we are becoming, who we hope to become relative to uh, uh, a person, let alone a worker. And then we also have to pay attention. We cannot be complacent. Complacency is the, 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 the big derailer of career development as far as I'm concerned. And so we can't be complacent about how work is evolving. And that means we have to take responsibility for ongoing lifelong learning, uh, uh, paying attention to trends, uh, trying to stay as much as we can ahead of the curve related to our own particular industries and what the opportunities are and what they are not. And uh, and so there is, I think, and both sides of that equation, uh, uh, those two uh, facts, there is a, a huge space for personal responsibility. Now, I think the wise employer would be aware of that as well and can respond to that in, I think, very important ways, which, again, maybe we'll talk about well, that's brilliant because we are going to start talking about that right now, Spencer. Look at that. This is amazing. We're on such a we're on such a a, a wavelength here, the three of us. Uh, exactly. It's like we're reading like each other's minds. We're we're playing a great game of ping pong here, and we're just laying it up for the slam on the other side. It's wonderful. I appreciate that. So, yeah, let me ask the question then, the follow up question to that. So, yeah, yeah, Chris. what are, let's say an organization gets it right, okay? They get it right for the career guidance and the learning development efforts. What are some of the opportunities that are then available to those employees and the employer 
you know, in the job market as they're, as they, as that organization has put in place a great way to accept and react to development and the learning required for it. So what's, what are the benefits to employers and workers for that kind of uh, scenario to be? Yes. Yep. Operating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, uh, we can, if we can just imagine that the three of us can just imagine what that sort of workplace experience might be like. I don't know how common it is, frankly, but we can imagine what it, what it might be like to work in an environment where your employer is sensitive to aware of, uh, responsive to the fact that you are continuing to evolve, that careers are nonlinear, they're not fixed, that you continue to evolve and you continue to have experiences and, 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 and you uh, need to, it's a basic, uh, it's a basic fact of human development. You need to be able to respond to those experiences in ways that acknowledge how you're developing, growing, and and then adapting and and this and the the wise employer i think is sensitive to that basic fact of human development knowing that there's fluidity non-linearity in career development and that means that they have to at the same time be looking at their employees not as uh fixed agents in a specific job doing a specific thing today tomorrow forever and ever amen but rather that they are accumulating experiences that are preparing them for things that we don't might not even be aware of quite yet relative to opportunities but that sort of flexibility adaptability in the workplace and part of employer to acknowledge how you're developing and growing i mean i don't know about you but for me uh, that's the kind of place where i want to work that's the that's the place where I feel like I can grow and develop and become, as they might say, my best self, and uh, achieve, as the uh, positive psychologists would say, my fullest potential as a person and a worker. And so the benefits are that you have an engaged employee. Let's face it, whether it's school or work, a disengaged student, a disengaged employee, is bad news is bad news because it connects to everything that's important. It connects to uh, productivity, it connects to atmosphere, it connects to morale. And so when you can foster a culture of sort of vibrancy, connectedness, you know, I think, you know, obviously one of the big challenges right now is retention. And, um, and I think there's, I think there are some things that we can do uh, to really try to support our workers' commitment and engagement, as well as then obviously retention. What well, what goes into creating an environment that elevates employee well-being and career development? And maybe as part of that one-minute answer, how how have requirements been been changed by the crisis and its aftermath? Yeah, it's, uh, I think there's greater attention to, uh, it needs to be greater attention to, on both sides, employer, employee, on um, fit. That is not just a simple old fashioned way of thinking of fit and your skills and interests. And oh, those are important. You know, skills and interests are obviously important. Yet uh, it goes obviously, as we know, far beyond that into val values and purpose. And so is this a place on the employee side? Is this a place where I can experience a sense of being able to express uh, uh, my values and find purpose. I think more and more of that question, especially among millennials and Gen Zers, is, is, uh, is, is prominent. And then, uh, again, because that is the fact, I think being aware of that uh, on, the, on the employer side and having conversations and acknowledging that is not something that, uh, we don't do that kind of thing here, uh, but embracing it and helping people uh, uh, connect in that way in terms of that broader sense of fit's really important fit in terms of colleagues community uh, that, that sort of connection is maybe a better word than fit in this respect you know how do i can how well do i connect with my colleagues and community and, and so uh, i mean being uh, i think it's important to be attention attentive to that and and there's always the benefit tumult question you know that one it's always the always a big question. People are always asking at some level, I think, in terms of uh, make, 
well-being and so forth. What do I give up if I leave this place? What do I give up? What do I lose? What's the benefit to me for staying? What do I gain if I stay? That benefit tumult question um, is always, uh, you know, the the uh, the I think uh, underlying key question, even on an intuitive level, that people sort of wonder about and sort through day to day. So we're being responsive to those things. You've referenced it in in the in the discourse we've had so far. You're talking about engagement, mm. you know, and we're talking about mm. the loss of workers, the you know, trying to hire people. Some people don't always look to retain, but we know that yeah. retaining is through engaging. So, you know, the question that comes back yes. to how can uh, an organization providing avenues to upskill and transition people into new roles can ensure that they keep their best people? You know, by having uh, an awareness of uh, the fact that uh, that um, a work experience is a human experience. There are a few things more personal that, to an individual than what they choose to do for their work. And uh, many uh, uh, people, uh, especially I think younger folks these days have a focus on meaningful work, how they might define that meaningful work where I get to express who I am, where I get to connect to uh, people and, and express my purpose. And uh, those kinds of uh, connections uh, are really uh, essential, I think, for employers to kind of be sensitive to and aware of. And so it's it it is a shift. And I, you you described it literally like turning the turning the ship around a bit uh, uh, that. But I think that um, you know old forms of leadership, you know, that are maybe a bit more uh, patriarchal, a bit more uh, autocratic, and so forth. In my mind, are are not going to be sensitive to. The sort of development experience that people are having when they come to work and so uh if you want to retain the best i think you you're going to be sensitive to that skip i'm gonna i'm gonna upset you i'm, I'm sorry for doing so but uh the, the the reality is the reality is uh we are coming towards the end of this conversation no uh, bill no i know we got to find another excuse to do it again um but yeah for sure. um We've got we've got two more questions for you, and 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 this next uh -oh. one is one. This, this is a, this is a good one, actually, I think, and uh, it, it's uh, one that we ask. How do you spell that, ask... Bill? How do you spell that? Good. Good. Only only Brits can spell it. You guys could never spell it. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. Um, it's th th this one is one we ask all of our all of our guests, and and it could be a one word answer. Who knows? Um, but the question is, as we look to wrap up, we like to ask our guests from a, from a culture and people processes perspective, what what does a high performing organization mean to you? Well, I, th I think that um, place where workers are engaged feel a sense of purpose for what. Uh, that workplace is focused on what their goals are, connected to them, clear about them, connected to them, able to find their way in terms of their own career development within that workplace experience. This has been a, yes, a great session. We appreciate it. I've enjoyed getting to meet you and hearing your response. Me too. It's been fun. Crafted. Thank you. You know, the important thing is not just about us, but you know what? How can our audience learn more about you? I'm a, uh, my, my, my daytime gig is I'm a professor at uh, the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, where I, I did serve as dean there for uh, seven years. And, uh, and now I'm uh, on the faculty uh, full time and enjoying that immensely. So my email there is SG Niles, N-I-L-E-S. So it's SG N-I-L-E-S at WM as in Mary dot E-D-U. I'm also a co-founder of something called the Hope Action Theory, and you can find me on LinkedIn, LinkedIn with our Hope Action Theory group. And we do workshops and certification courses to help people elevate the uh, sense of uh, uh, hope in a person's career. How do you help people create and sustain a sense of hope? And we do a course that trains people on how to do that. And so that then it's usually. Uh, and we have a we have a class going on right now with about 45 folks from Australia. We're getting ready to launch another one in a couple of weeks for folks from primarily from Japan, not exclusively. But we do these courses training people to on this what we think is essential, and it's what we've been talking about around the edges. But I didn't mention it until now. The the essential importance of hope. How do you help workers 
How do you help people create and sustain a sense of hope for their work and their lives? That's what, we, that's what I'd like to focus on. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today. Bill, I'll let you wrap it up. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just a little plug here for some other show called uh, the HR Chat Podcast. Um, you can you can check out an interview that I did with uh, with, with Skip and with a chap called Phil Harrington uh, on on the HR Chat Podcast. It's episode three hundred and one. Um, but enough of that, Chris. We're, we're we're here today for the People and Performance Podcast. Um, so I just want to uh, finish off then by saying, Skip, uh, it's been a delight yes, to, to get an opportunity to interview you again. Um, you are you are a wonder, and uh, unfortunately, this is an audio podcast so our, our listeners can't see your wonderful face and your lovely background but um it looks uh, like you've got a very pleasant life um and uh, um i hope to uh, get an opportunity to to see you again very soon that would be fantastic thanks thanks bill thanks chris i enjoyed it this podcast is supported by fidelo inc a consulting firm specializing in improving human performance through their products and services, Fidelo helps clients design, develop, and implement strategic, integrated human resource processes and systems. Learn more at fidelo.com. That's F-I-D-E-L-L-O.com.